Hello, hello, Google New York. Hello, folks on the live stream. Welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Brandon Lee, and I am thrilled to be your moderator for today. Well, folks, we got a very special event lined up for y'all. But first, there's, there's one thing I want to know. Do we have any Gotham chess fans in the building? <laughs> All right, so our guest is returning to Google today to discuss his new book, How to Win a Chess, as well as the recent chess boom, and really the world of chess at large on and off the 64 squares. And then as always, after the talk, there'll be an opportunity for audience Q&A. So take note of any questions you wanna be asking. And without further ado, let's introduce our guest. So he is the man behind the biggest chess channel on YouTube with 5 million subscribers. Almost. <laughs> Everyone subscribe today, we'll get to 5 million. On the chessboard, he holds the prestigious title of International Master. And finally, he's been featured in places like Wired, The New York Times, and Forbes 30 Under 30. He's the internet's chess teacher and he loves to sacrifice the rook. Please give it up for New York's very own Levy Rosman, also known as Gotham Chess. Welcome back to Google. It's your third time here, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've been like on a little uh, tour. Like I, I, I've been in um, Chicago, Los Angeles, London, but you know, New York is home, so. Like to be back in New York. This is uh, this is the place that feels the most like home to me. And we're glad to have you. And I gotta say, before finding your channel, I never thought I'd be into watching videos about chess. But you just make chess so fun. And I feel like you really challenge a lot of the preconceived ideas that people have about chess and chess players. Like, you don't have to be a genius to enjoy chess. And also, chess players can be hilarious and charismatic. So me, I, you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You've done really great for the game. And I wanted to just kick us off by asking, you've given a lot of your life to chess, obviously, right? If you had to really break it down, what is it that you love so much about this game? Why has it meant so much to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, probably, I would say, as a kid, like there's different phases of why uh, I, I continued to play. I had such a fascination with the game. Uh, as a kid, I think it felt like every single game was a, was a new puzzle. So if you buy a puzzle from a store, even now as an adult, not just as a child, and you solve it, I don't, I feel like if you disassemble it and reassemble it, you might be a sociopath. Uh, like I, I don't know, I, maybe that's, I, I, if that's the thing people do, then I'm, I'm very sorry, but I, like I don't do that. I, I just, I assemble it once, I watch something once, I do something once, I'm like a little bit bored. And uh, I don't, I generally don't do it again. Uh, but I love chess because every game is a new puzzle. Every game is a new opportunity to challenge yourself uh, to solve something, figure something out. And uh, I think as an adult, the, the biggest thing for me that has um, kept me interested and, and fascinated is uh, that I win a lot <laughs> when I play. Uh, and beyond that, like beyond if I boot up a game, I have a 65% chance of winning it, and, you know, winning that game, and then I feel nice about myself. Uh, I think it's really special to see the, the ability and like the, um, the scope and the scale at which people can play the game and they don't find it boring and they, the, the, the stereotypes about it have changed, the stigma has changed, people's perception has changed, it's an ageless game, uh, young, you know, young, young kids, older folks, senior citizens can play it and uh, that's, that's what motivates me. And then now growing the sport, it's this very unique marriage of uh, creators, uh, business, sponsors, eSport, like there's every buzzword you can throw together. Chess has a, a massive potential to grow and it, it very well could be kind of the, the new sport that can uh, develop. It's cool to hear how that um, love for the game has evolved over time for different reasons and we're definitely gonna get into a lot of things that you shared about. Uh, and we've also seen that you've got, gotten to be involved in a lot of really cool projects over the past year. Things like chess boxing, you know, you even did like chess while you're hooked up to a lie detector which is really fun. Yeah. Uh, of all the things that you've gotten to do over the past year, what sticks out to you as something that was especially fun and memorable? Oh, I like these questions. Usually you do these things and the questions are like things you already, uh, you know, you, you, have, you have answers that you've done before. I think chess boxing was really special because it was so ridiculous. <laughs> and if you haven't seen that, 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 live stream, you, you gotta go watch it. Uh, it, was a, it, it was a very nerve wracking experience for me because I make content uh, recaps of top tournaments. 
I sit in my office, I analyze some games, and then I show the key moments. I yell, sacrifice the rook, although that was not intended to become that big of a meme. That was a totally accidental thing. And then, and then that's it. You know, I, I covered the chess world, I watched the chess games and so on. And when I stepped into a live arena of 10,000 people, I was terrified. I was shocked, you know, there's gonna be so many live fans, this is, this is crazy, this is 10,000. How do 500,000 people watch a chess recap? Uh, and I was nervous the whole, the whole time. And the second the lights went on, it, I was just in the zone. I had the headphones on, it was just covering the games. You guys might have not even realized, the broadcast broke 10 times and I was in my element just, they would go to the bird's eye view, I have to break that down now, I have to show people. And I, what I've discovered over the last few years, and it's probably been from the years past of teaching kids and making the game accessible at, at such a young age to, to people, uh, I, I am able to, to kind of get into the mind of the viewer and help them understand what's happening and most importantly why it's important and why they should care and why they should keep watching. So I think chess boxing was a super unique uh, way to do that. But I would love if we could do a physical 100 type of thing, mm. but for chess. Mm -mm. <laughs> you know, like a knockout, you know, a spectacle and, uh, of, uh, of amateur players and there's these crazy formats and uh, that's kind of the next big idea for me and, and I just want to keep uh, developing these kind of big projects. You're like one-on-one -on -one trying to fight over a chess piece in the middle? Uh, well, it may, yeah, oh, no, no, not like physical battle, but like <laughs> elimination style. Uh, hey, we could do that too, though. Like arm wrestling, you gotta, yeah. Uh, there's a lot, though. There's a lot you could do. And so many people around the world play chess. So many athletes, celebrities, musicians, uh, kids, adults, teenagers. Like I said, it, it's really special. Can you quickly explain for folks who don't know what chess boxing is? Yes. Uh, chess boxing is uh, a format where you do, let's say, 10 rounds. And let's say me and you play, a, we, we start, we play chess. So we get five minutes each for that chess game. So that would be 10 minutes total. And that chess, first chess round lasts, let's say, one minute. So we lose a minute off the clock mutually. We pause the chess game, we put on gloves, and we beat the crap out of each other. So if I'm beating him on the chess board, he now has, if he's the better fighter, he could knock me out. That's the point of the game. And then the other point of the game is to see how you react uh, in a cerebral activity after doing such crazy physical exertion and uh, potentially taking damage, obviously. I mean, now we're in a world where influencers don't know what to do with themselves, so they just beat each other up like purely. <laughs> like Creator Clash, and it, it is nuts. I was at Creator Clash, I was watching like, oh my god, I can feel the, the savage in me just kind of like, oh yes, like keep hitting each other. <laughs> but, in, but in chess, it's, it's, you got both. You can't overexert, and uh, yeah, we, we kind of crave that type of stuff, and that is chess boxing, and it's, uh, it is a wild one. It is really, and I thought I was gonna fight, I got in the gym, boxing's a great exercise. Second I got hit in the head, I was like, nope. <laughs> you gotta, I'm gonna play chess, thank you. Uh, Self-defense is good, you gotta get on the train sometimes. You know, you gotta, but uh, other than that, uh, no, we're not fighting anybody in a sanctioned bout. You're also bigger than me, so we wouldn't do chess boxing against no, each no, other. No, I'm, no, I'm a better chess player, but I, I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, one punch, I'm, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm happy not to get hit. So you are an author now. You're a YouTuber turned author. Um, I thought the book was really well done. I think like all your YouTube content, you just have a really great way of understanding the mindset of people at different levels in the game. And I think you make the game really approachable without sacrificing the information, which I think is, is really great. Uh, how did you decide to put out a book? Yeah, great question. I was always very intimidated by the concept of putting out a book for multiple reasons. First of all, my mom's an author. She's a science author, Lena Zeldovich. She, write, she wrote a book about uh, waste. For everything from human waste to like, uh, and, and the way people are doing you know, incredible things with, with uh, getting uh, minerals and nutrients out of it and fecal transplants, which are like a crazy health breakthrough. And she's been working on a second book and I watched her book process and thought, oh my God, that is so intimidating. It is so much easier to, to make digital content about chess because that's the second reason, you can make a mistake in a video, in a, in a chess video. You can make a mistake and say, the game was played in 2013 and not 2023. And your audience goes, ha, stupid. And that's it. Everybody moves on. Like, but it, if you make a, a piece, of, like, a, like a book, which is a, a physical product, and yes, I understand it can go through, not all books are, are perfect, there's mistakes. My book has little typos and things like that. That was a lot of pressure because if you're gonna buy a chess book and I wanted it to be the chess book you recommend for a new chess player, I put a lot of pressure on myself. It took a long time to write the book, uh, but I ultimately did make the jump. 
And I think it also motivated me a lot to have a very big publishing partner. You know, the Penguin wanted to work with me, and that's a big deal. I wasn't self-publishing. They took a lot out of you know, my hands of designing the cover, getting the PR out and everything. I just had to focus on writing a really good book. Uh, I wrote that damn book. I read it cover to cover twice on flights to Los Angeles and back, I think, for chess boxing, by the way. So I read the book cover to cover. I edited it, hand wrote it. It was a crazy process. I'm very happy with it. And now they want me to write a second one. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm scared, but I might do it. So, and I'm very happy with the reception. I think, it's all, I think we've almost sold 100,000 copies. So yes, very exciting. That's a New York Times bestseller. Yes, which then I was promptly told uh, you can buy uh, uh, yourself onto the bestsellers list. And then after I did Forbes 30 under 30, I got a bunch of comments like you can buy your way to that too. So I'm, I'm a nobody. <laughs> I, what, everything I've done is, it sucks. I, you know, uh, but uh, that, was very, that was very cool. The first week the book dropped in October, I was above Atomic Habits. Nice. Not anymore though. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was a good week. I felt very proud. So for folks who are familiar with your channel, they might know that your book actually shares a name with your YouTube series, right? Yes. So I'm going I'm to ask you to put your, your teaching hat on for a second. Okay. Something that's really interesting is if you look at both of these things, they're actually very different in how they teach chess, right? Like the book, you're, you're telling us what to do. In the YouTube videos, you're, you're demonstrating in your own games, what, this is what I would do at this level, mm -hmm. right? So they're different strategies, but they're both effective at teaching chess. In your experiences as a teacher, have you picked up anything on how to teach chess effectively that you didn't know before, or, or really just teaching in general? Yeah, I definitely have. I think it's very important when you teach chess, number one, you have to, who's your student, right? So when, when I was teaching back in the day, my students were generally as young as four and five in schools, and as old as around 13, 14, right around that middle school age is when kids decide chess and my other hobbies just aren't cutting it. I have to focus on high school and college. It's very common right now. Uh, and so obviously I would adjust my lexicon, my delivery, and also my level of intensity of, ch of teaching. Because if you teach for 60 minutes straight, kids like, you know, and then what's the, what's the use, right? So I would do little bursts of like 10 to 15 minutes, now let's do a fun activity, let's, let's demo it, let's test it. You've gotta give kids the opportunity to play. But what I have noticed, uh, now that I teach, I, I also started teaching adults back in the day, adults are terrible learners. We are such bad learners because we all have egos. We have like, uh, we have uh, a, a real uh, inability to fail. Like we just, because everything we do in life, we can't, even in school, we couldn't fail a, a quarter of the time. That's a 75% score. You wouldn't get into any good school, etc. In chess, you fail 45 to 55% of the time. Like, nobody wants to do an activity like that. Uh, and so you have to kind of adjust what your, um, what your teaching strategy is for anything, chess, sports, uh, literally anything else. Uh, and um, yeah, over, over my life, I've, I've adjusted the strategy a bit, and I definitely had to adjust the strategy when I started making content, because the truth is you have a million and one things you can watch on a phone, on a laptop, uh, on a TV, and when I entered Chess YouTube in 2020, it was barren. Nothing existed. Like, people were making content with no cameras, and, uh, and I just had to believe in, in my ability to deliver an accessible way to look at the game but also one that you have to care about. Like if I could summarize the whole thing, it's you have to adjust your teaching to your audience. You also have to make them care because we have so many things we can dedicate our time to. And if you care about it, you're gonna watch, you're gonna come back, you might spend some money on a book or on a course. And this would be, I mean, just, an, just general advice. So mm. uh, that's been my strategy. It's been the strategy with the book mm. and kind of everything that I do. Yeah, the age comparison is interesting to me, adults and kids. As I've reflected on, I used to compete in tennis. And I used to get really, so you talked about the ego thing for adults. And if I were to do something differently in my junior tennis career, it would be not getting so discouraged about losses. Did you mm -hmm. see that happen in your, your uh, kids' students? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, very difficult. You know, when you go to a chess tournament, you get four cracks at, a, at, a, uh, you know, at, at, at games. And um, some kids would go two and two. And you only learn some, you only really lose in a chess game if you learn nothing. You can uh, not learn, you can learn something from a game you won, you can learn something from a game that you lost. You can learn more things from a game that you won because you made 10 mistakes. Like, but, you, but the result makes us not go back and, and review those types of things. Uh, yeah, but of course, competitive chess is very, very different. Uh, some of you in here are guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. Sometimes I lose a game. I get so mad. And like two minutes later, I feel really dumb because why did I get so mad? I'm about to lose like 200 more games this week. Mm. You know, <laughs> Why did I burn so much of my soul losing on this one game? And, 
It happens to me in tennis. It happens to me in squash. And I'm, you know, 23, 22 is my international chess ELO. My tennis ELO is 700. I have no openings. You know, I can rally a bit. I don't really know where to be on the, uh, where my feet positioning, blah, blah, blah. And I get so mad when I miss tennis shots too. Like, I'm just an idiot. Why am I getting so mad? You know, I got a long life to live. Before I'm gonna burn all my nervous system up, you know, in my 20s and 30s. So, uh, yeah, losing is a big part of it. And you just have to learn to lose, have your internal tantrum, your coping mechanism, and then you have to uh, get better. And I'm, I'm working on it. It's not easy. I, I think it's a great segue. I wanted to draw attention to one line in the book that I really enjoyed. Uh, which was, in chess, like in life, everything should be in moderation. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. I think, uh, are you saying I have a drinking problem? <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, Do you remember what chapter it's from? No, I have no idea what chapter it's from. It's the, the Gambit's chapter. Makes sense. Moderation. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. No, I don't remember line by line of the book. I remember some of the fun facts, like when I beat Hikoro with the curl. Uh, oh, and that was a nice one. Uh, no, but it's true. Uh, j just like... In gambits, in anything, yeah. uh, a, lot, a lot of you in here do too many puzzles, and they make you feel good because your puzzle rating is like 2,800. And then you get in the game, you hang all your pieces. It's like <laughs> that structured moment where you know there's an answer and there's a little light bulb and you got to solve it. Like You're good at that, but then... So what I did with something with puzzles is I, I on my educational platform, I did anti-puzzle. So now you get positions which are maybe stable. You don't know if there's a puzzle uh, answer, if there's a tactic. So you have to either say it's a stable position or not. It's a really nice way. And then you can reverse it. You can say, does your opponent have a tactic on you? So these little things, I, I like to kind of dig into what exists in the chess world learning tool wise and, and what doesn't and, and build it. And you know, uh, that's, that's sort of how I, I spend my time. And then um, kind of on that thread. So I feel like I've personally learned a lot of lessons from chess. So one that sticks out to me, so there's obviously the you know, obvious stuff like decision making, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, one that sticks out to me is uh, oftentimes there's more options available to you than you initially realize. It's like when a move looks impossible, but it's actually the best move, mm -hmm. right? Do you feel like uh, there are other life lessons you've taken from chess or that it's influenced how you are as a person? Yeah, I, I hate to go back to something we already talked about. The biggest one by far is, um, is obviously learning to, to learn from failure, mm. uh, but also you know, you gotta, you gotta check yourself even if something went right. Mm. Uh, patience is a massive one. I'm still learning, you know, I'm still learning that to this day. Just chess helps you, chess is sort of a microcosm of everything you do well in life and also everything you do really poorly. So your study habits, uh, you know, everything from diet, exercise, things you should focus a bit more on, things you slack on, things you over obsess over and then, and then you, you kind of fall into the trap uh, during your chess games. There's a lot, um, patience, learning to deal with loss. I mean, I can rattle off you know, many, many buzzwords, but the best way to, to summarize it is it will expose everything you do in your day-to-day -day well and also poorly, and usually poorly will be center stage. Because like I said, you fail a lot. You, you, you do. I mean, your tennis rally might go five shots and you miss on the six. That's an 83% success rate. Like, you're not winning 83% of your games, you're going to get banned. That's what's going to happen. And you're probably cheating. So, uh, or you're playing someone you're you know, much stronger than. So there's a lot. I mean... Uh, patience and learning to lose and, and, and it teaches me a new thing like every week I would say. So chess has exploded in the last several years. Uh, 2020 in particular was a big year for chess and it sounds like that's also when you jumped onto YouTube. For folks who weren't following along with with the chess boom could you kind of recap for us what you saw happen? Yes I will try to do this uh, in like a 60 to 90 second summary. So nobody played chess before 2020. It was like the Big Bang. <laughs> Literally, uh, no one even knew it existed. Uh, I was bullied my whole life for playing chess. It was just this, you know, nerd activity you did, and it was. I mean, I would visit my grandparents in Brooklyn, and we would stroll. There would be some, you know, ex-Soviet uh, 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 seventy-year-olds, and they'd sit there going, "You want to play? Okay, come." On. And then, like, that would be. That's how I grew up playing chess. Uh, in fourth grade, my teacher asked me to bring my nationals trophy to school. By the way, just so you know, chess trophies are like this tall, and I'm not <laughs> short. All right, so. Like, they're really big. They're taller than baseball, taekwondo. They're like some of the tallest trophies in the world. I was embarrassed. I didn't want to bring a trophy to school because people would know I played chess and they would make fun of me. And that was, you know, that was my life. Like anybody in here knows you did anything nerdy in school, you were made fun of. Uh, and that can really shape you. That's, that stuff leaves scars. Uh, but I was a chess teacher it, from 2014 until literally COVID. Like that was, I was, uh, I was going to college. I was deciding... Am I going to do something more corporate? My family was telling me I needed to get a real job and have health insurance. Uh, and I was like, I want to be a chess teacher because I really like it. 
and they pay me cash. So <laughs> we're going to be a chess teacher. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and I did that from 2014 to 2020. But I ran my own program. I didn't like working for someone the same way I kind of have, like, a, you know, I'm, I run my channel. I, I reached out to a bunch of schools and said, hey, I want to start an after school program. And then let's play some tournaments. I want to get all these kids playing tournaments and, and motivate them. And uh, I started in fall 2015 in a school in Brooklyn. And uh, January, so four months later, we won second place in you know, kindergarten chess championship of New York City. I was like, yes, this is everything I wanted. Like, let's get a dynasty going, you know? <laughs> and five years later, you know, I turned that into just some after school programs uh, and students and, 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 and teaching the group classes. I was doing camps and we were running tournaments and COVID happened. And I remember walking out of a lesson and going, oh, we have like our first COVID case in New York. <laughs> Two weeks of a vacation, nice. And then, uh, yeah, the world changed. And obviously, I, you know, I started doing a little bit more of this online stuff. And chess has completely exploded over the last four years in three distinct points. There was sort of like pre-Queen's Gambit, a little bit of hype, more live streams getting watched. Pog Champs was a big thing. Uh, that was like that. That was like you go to the Michelin restaurant, they give you the free dish. And you're like, what is this mushroom tea? I have no idea. Well, whatever. I'm going to pretend like I like it. And then we had Queen's Gambit. And Queen's Gambit, I started noticing the effects of in uh, 2020, uh, in October, because people would watch the trailer and then they would watch How to Play the Queen's Gambit, which I had uploaded three months prior, not knowing what Netflix's Queen's Gambit was, because it was just How to Play the Queen's Gambit. So my 48 hour viewing window went from 100K to a million. And I was like, what? <laughs> Chess fans? Okay, we need, we need a game plan. And for a year, basically from 2020 to 2021, I uploaded two videos a day of everything. I mean, opening videos, middle game videos, like ladder climbing, you know, climbing the, the ELO ladder, you know, recaps of major events. And that has been my life for four years. I mean, I probably have missed the total of like 10 days when I haven't made a video and half of those I had COVID. So I, just, I, I really enjoy it. If I have 30 minutes to an hour in a day to talk about something interesting in chess, whether it's my life, something that's happening, some Tyler One, the League of Legends guy is 1900 now, you know, like drama with the cheating devices. Like that's what I'm gonna make uh, <laughs> content on. And uh, unfortunately though, chess kind of relies on these spikes. We have Queen's Gambit, um, then we have uh, the cheating scandal, Magnus, Magnus and Hans, $100 million lawsuit, insertable cheating devices or lack thereof. <laughs> Uh, and uh, obviously that was a big meme that never happened, but Elon Musk tweeted about it, so everybody thought it happened. And then there was uh, the short form explosion. So January 2023, that was, uh, that was a massive thing. And uh, it took me a year and a half to go from two to three mil uh, one to two million subs, and it took me 40 days to go from two to three. So that was all fueled by short form content. Uh, people would watch chess and go, oh, I'm curious. Now I'm going to watch long form. And so chess has this very unique progression of short to long form, which a lot of channels struggle with. A lot of channels, they can put out some crazy prank or stunt or whatever, but no, there's no, you're not going to watch a 30 minute video. I see a lot of channels like this that have insane view count, uh, subscriber counts, but their regular content just gets kind of regular viewership. I've really tried to make that pipeline of you're going to get in through a short and now you have to watch the long, you got you to figure it out. And um, we're sort of on a downtrend now because nobody's cheated in a while or nor hasn't. And then, you know, uh, nobody sued anybody. Uh, short form naturally kind of goes through its ebbs and flows, but uh, that's why we got to keep developing new things. So those were the three big points for us. I just want to say you were the one who went there on the cheating devices. That wasn't me for the record. Yeah, uh, no lawsuits, please. It did not happen. All right. No, no <laughs> sue him. He said it. I, <laughs> um, no, no, but that was that was why. Listen, for for a content creator in the chess space, stuff like that is great because People come in and they're gonna watch chess videos. They're gonna go, wow, this chess world's crazy. I gotta learn to play that. I remember doing this 20 years ago, you know? And uh, now I can do it with my, uh, with my kid or I can do it with my, with my grandchild or, or whatever. I can do it with my partner. Like we can play chess. We, uh, we can, you know, Wednesday night at the local bar, we, can, we go to a little chess night. So that's, that's that ecosystem now. And I, I don't care if there's a cheating scandal, more people are gonna play chess, great. So as big as chess has gotten, I know that you're not satisfied with where it's at, right? So you wanna see it go further. What's the dream for you? both in the media, but then also like in communities and culture? Yeah, so at the high level, I want the chess ecosystem to resemble tennis. I want the economics to resemble tennis, but with one giant caveat in the fact that tennis has a live audience, chess can't have a live audience. So maybe chess can do things like fan zones. Chess can do uh, other forms of uh, fan activation. 
that's obviously a very, uh, a very big issue. But um, chess at the high level is not, the boom of chess is not felt at the high level at all. All their tournaments are the same. Uh, they're relatively kind of invitational. Uh, they are not fun to watch. They are six to seven hours long. That's why everybody watches my recaps. That is why I am more popular than most top chess players. And that shouldn't be the case. Like, there should not be a tennis YouTuber who's more famous than every tennis player. He could be, he or she, they could be famous. Great, they could have millions. They could show you stuff and teach you how to play tennis and, 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 and all that. But the, the players are the players. It doesn't exist in chess. We don't have that. I dream of the whole thing to change for there to be a clear calendar of tournaments that we tune into once or twice a month. We know what we're watching. We know what the stakes are. None of that exists. As we speak, there's like seven tournaments going on in the world. They all have different stakes. Some are online, some are offline. And uh, in half of them, people are accusing people of cheating. Like, it's a mess. It's a mess. And I, I want that to change. I want there to be much more caring. And I want these, these players, when they come up as teenagers, I don't want them to drop off and go to college and get a, a corporate job because they don't see a future. Like, there's a lot of chess players who are very good at 14, 15, but if you don't break into that upper echelon, you don't get those invitations, um, you end up quitting the game. And that's that. Now, for uh, fans like day to day and, and just people in their communities, oh, so much. Uh, I, I would love if there was, you know, Spin, the ping pong club. Mm. Let's make that one with chess. Let's make a nice high end club uh, that we can have tournaments, we can do camps, we can have like adult only so you don't have to play a six year old that's picking their nose and beating you at the same time. <laughs> like, let's get you away from the kids, you know? Like, let's, let's we, got, we got to get a little bit more of that. Uh, and and that's, that's all on the table, it's all on the agenda. I would, I would love to see it happen. And, um, people are lonely now. The last four years have, have really got us glued to screens. We play a lot online, but let's, let's start getting off the screens, back to chess clubs. I want to start doing some kind of meetups around, maybe first we'll start with the US, like 50 to 100 just meetups, like just people who show up, they register, they don't have to pay anything, let's, let's just play some chess in person. Um, let's teach our friends how to play chess, let's teach our kids a very useful skill. Uh, not just because it all will result in more views for me. I, I appreciate that, but that's, that's uh, my goal on the two sides. Spin for chess sounds awesome. Yeah. yeah. If anybody wants to invest, hit me up. Yeah. So we'll, we'll make it happen. Like. So I'm curious. I feel like the perception I have is sometimes the chess world can be a little bit resistant to change. Maybe it's a little bit different with the online scene. But uh, in your interactions with other you know, like big players in the, in the chess space, do you feel like people are generally on the same page with you on, on your vision for where you want to see the game go? Or do we need like a chess summit where we get everybody into a room and hash things out? and try to kind of strategize around this? No, they're definitely not all on the same page. And the, the interesting thing about chess as, a, as an ecosystem at the competitive level is that if you imagine uh, football, not the one where you throw, that one makes no sense. Although YouTube TV got me into the NFL last year, and uh, now I'm a huge NFL fan, and I can't wait for the Chiefs to lose. Um, sorry, uh, I was rooting against them, and then they won. But uh, uh, um, I've... Uh, I, you, your question was, I went uh, on the uh, NFL rant and then I... <laughs> we can call it there, no, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. So, um, be... I was curious what other people in the chess world... Yes, 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 yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, other people in the chess world are definitely not aligned. Uh, they want the Chiefs to win. No, um, <laughs> so we have, uh, we have two massive kind of overseeing bodies, right? We have kind of the FIFA, which is FIDE, the international governing body, they do things the way they do things, right? They have, their, they have a lot of different social programs, it's true. They do chess in schools, they do chess in, I think they do chess like for old folks in, in nursing homes, they do chess in prisons, which is actually a massive program, like believe it or not, like it's a, it's a really, really big hit. Like they do a lot of social programs and they have the World Chess Championship, right? Like the one-on-one -on -one match. And that's kind of like the boxing UFC one-on-one -on -one thing where it's not an open format of who can win, it's you have to qualify, you have to win that thing. And that is the ultimate crown. Uh, and that's kind of all they got. You know, like the rest of these tournaments I'm talking about that are happening as we speak right now, there's a tournament now in, in, um, in the Gulf, called Sharjah Masters, very, very strong tournament. Uh, there's, uh, there's another tournament going on online right now. But they're not all aligned. And so the major question of, of chess, since we don't have any live spectators, is do we really want a six hour, is there a future of a six to seven hour product that will make the game marketable and scalable? The answer is no, absolutely, unequivocally no, no chance. Not a single person here is gonna watch a six hour chess match, like from start to finish. You'll, you'll poke in and out. Even the candidates, the most important tournament of the year, I would go walk my dog and 40 minutes later come home, nobody made a move. You're not, get, you're not, you're not getting that shit on TV, I'm telling you, like it's not gonna work. I, and the problem is though, when you speed up chess, 
you're really messing with the integrity and kind of like the, the accuracy of the game. I know there's a lot of questions now about baseball. They started speeding it up, and I think tennis maybe a little bit, but not on the level of chess. If you give a chess player 25 minutes versus 90 minutes, it's going to be a pretty drastic difference. The level will still be really high, but you're messing with kind of the integrity of the game. And I just interviewed the CEO of the International Chess Federation, and he kind of said, do we really want to teach kids that... Uh, you know, you want to speed things up to make it more massive, you know, for mass appeal, or do we want to stick to kind of like the roots of the game and, and the fact that it's cerebral? And he has a point, but it's going to be really difficult to grow the game and get sponsorship. And chess historically has relied on obscure billionaires to come in, give a bunch of money for whatever reason. I have really no idea why they're doing it. And they just support the game. If you go back any amount of tournaments, that's sort of how it works. And that's great. Even the Sinkfield, uh, chess uh, event in St. Louis, the entire St. Louis area is now where the Chess Hall of Fame is. That's because of the efforts of one man and his team, Rex Singfield. And that's why it's called Singfield Cup, and he's done an incredible job. But what if he just never got an interest in chess? I mean, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't exist, right? And if you think about these tournaments in the Gulf, there are three tournaments back-to-back -back in the Gulf, and I think they're spending, I don't they must be spending well over a million dollars on the conditions. It's incredible, like the prizes, the venue. And um, why? Like, why are they doing it, right? That's the question, and chess has relied way too long on that, and that's why it's having a problem of, of growing, and, and that's why we can't get a, a, a watch partner. How does a game, which is literally played every game with a clock, not have a watch partner? This is, this, is, this is the problem, and I'm trying, I'm trying, but I don't run a company, you know, I don't run, I don't run the International Federation, I'm me. And like, there is a stigma of, I don't want to listen to this YouTuber. He's like, he's, what is he, like 20 something? Like, why would I listen to him? We got history. Like, this game has been around for centuries. Nobody's tried to speed it up. Nobody tried to. And um, yeah, historically, attempts at modernizing the game and, and changing the format have failed. Most notably with Gary Kasparov in the 90s, when he created his whole separate uh, association. And they had Intel as a sponsor. Maybe they were ahead of their time. Maybe now this, you know, that thing would work out. And, um, but yeah, changing the whole thing is a, uh, Big question mark, and maybe, maybe not, but no, not everybody is aligned. It's a very big question. So you've talked um, a bit about you know, the, the structure of the chess circuit being an issue. Another one I've heard people like yourself talk about as well is uh, on the viewership side, one of the challenges with chess is you kind of have to understand the game yeah. a bit to, to follow along with it. Have you heard any good ideas about, in broadcasting, how we can, you know, any ideas to make it more approachable? Right, great question. Uh, if you watch chess in a bar, do you know who's winning? If you watch chess, if you watch any sport in a bar, do you know who's winning? Like most of them, maybe not darts. Like I don't know who's winning in the darts, I got no idea. But bowling, he have more number than other guy. Like same with every sport, team has more number than, you know, and that's the way it works. For poker, it was the whole cards. Mm. I really started watching a lot more poker because I didn't know odds, I didn't know probabilities, mm. but I saw jacks. It's a good hand, I think. <laughs> Not even, by the way. There's like all meta about jacks and queens and whatever. But I would watch and I would go, oh, that's... Now the probability is this for this player. Yeah, chess has a lot to grow there. Uh, even I, when I watch chess broadcasts, I look at the screen and I message production at chess.com going, why is it like that? Dude, if I can't understand it, nobody can understand it. Like, I can barely see that screen. And chess, historically, commentators are always on the screen. Is Mike Breen on the screen all the time in the ESPN games? Like, no other sport has the commentators on the screen the entire match. Only chess. Why are we so narcissistic? Like, get us off the screen. More room for the, for the chess board and, uh, and the analysis board. But you know, the this problem is there's a live board and the analysis board. How do you merge the two? You know, in tennis, nobody's drawing a complete hypothetical while they're running. <laughs> so we have, we have difficulties. There is a, a big learning curve for chess. And if we can solve it, it would be massive. Part of that you know, physical 100 pitch, a limited series about amateurs playing, for me was mid-episode, 10 to 10, 20 second cutaways, where you just learn something. And now you leave that episode going, well, I know like four things about chess, which is sort of how the book goes. It kind of spoon feeds you things throughout the, and you're like, wait a minute, that was really easy. I thought it was really hard to do that. Um, and that would sort of be my, my approach, but I'm glad I don't have to design the, the broadcast. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, it's not easy, and if we need to get it into a marketable format, like three hours, it's going to be very tough. But I have hope. Slowly fading, but I have hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like the thing with chess is that um, a lot of the the greatness of you know the top players happens up here, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's almost kind of like in, in Marvel with Doctor Strange, like being like, oh, there's only one possibility that works, yeah. and to appreciate that, you can't. You have to kind of 
Yes. Figure and that out. By the way, watch any interview with a player after the match is over. They don't tell you things in generalities. They're not like, yeah, I was really worried. He was attacking me here, you know, and then this and this. They're like, yeah, uh, knight takes e4, and then, you know, he could have played bishop takes, and at f5, f, you know, at g6, I can, we can trade the pawns, and there's some weakness. And you, I'm sitting there going, I don't even remember the game. <laughs> so this is a completely pointless interview because this is like a therapy session for the player, <laughs> and no one knows what's happening. And then the interviewer's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> right, and so uh, what are your impressions of the city you're playing in? Like, it's, it's such a, it's so, because they just come out, they just want to talk chess. And again, like, if you take that away from them, we're, we're ruining that element of the sport. Like, you're very, you know, you're very accurate with that statement, is that it all, really all happens up here. If there was a way they could, they could do those interviews with a monitor, explain stuff, it'd be better, we still wouldn't understand it. Because they would rattle off 10, you know, they thought for 30 minutes. When, when Magnus or Hikaru or these guys, they think for 30 minutes, it's like incredible things happen up here, which we will never understand as much as we pretend that we will. And how do we like find the middle ground? It's a big question. I don't know. I saw you did this really interesting format, Team Chess, mm -hmm. where you had a partner and you were actually discussing verbally. The, I mean, you were playing with Hikaru, right? Yeah, it was mostly me making his <laughs> ideas. He would say and I would, yeah. But no, that was tough. It would be a little better if our levels were a bit closer. Yeah. Doing one, I think, of one of those, but yes. I did that. Yeah, that seems like an interesting brainstormed solution. I don't know if that will take off more than you know being a novelty, but do you feel like that's kind of spurred any inspiration for stuff like that? Will never be um, included in like a official circuit because it's kind of like legalized cheating. Mm. I mean, you're just kind of getting advice from from a second player, and it is very interesting as a format. I have thought of doing kind of family feud style, but with chess. You know. Uh, I, Gordon Ramsay and his family versus Barack Obama and his family, and they play a chess match. Like you know, like just crazy stuff like that. You know, for charity, because you know a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff is for charity. Celebrity Family Feud for charity, and, and Wheel of Fortune, all these stuff, uh, all these different shows. Uh, but it would be novelty. But stuff like that motivates more people to get interested in the game and ultimately play it. Uh, but I don't think stuff like that will take off, unfortunately. I wanted to kind of bring us back to uh, you know you talked about FIDE and in-person chess, and there's. A lot of the growth recently has been online, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting to me is that these formats, you know, obviously feel different to play, but culturally they feel very different, right? Like over the board, it, mm -hmm. it's much more uh, traditional, you know, guys are wearing suits. And I feel like online chess, it almost kind of has like more of an internet culture kind of vibe to it. Do you feel like these things are kind of going to converge at some point? And what, what do you see the relationship between them being? Uh, I think they can only converge if, like, going back to what I said, there's FIDE and there's Chess.com. Yep. Chess.com, over the last few years, they, they've done a lot, obviously. They have a very simple model of subscription, but they also bankroll so many tournaments. I mean, they have allowed so many grandmasters to, first of all, find students, but also play in second-tier events. And I'm not insulting anybody. If you're a top 150 player in the world, you can't play with the top players. You're just not strong enough, but you can win Division Two and qualify for Division One, and you just want some money. Every week, they have prize money tournaments. Uh, and, yes... I think the only way there could be this merge, FIDE cannot do what Chess.com does. Chess.com can do what FIDE does. That's the, major, that's the major thing. Only because they have the scope and they have the ability, they have the employees and the, uh, the investing, potentially. If they found a way to work together, obviously everybody wants to make money, everybody wants to control stuff, but if they found a way to work together and you let, because again, FIDE will never have the online base. The online base will follow the Chess.com events and personalities influencers, and then if there's going to be uh, candidates or a World Chess Championship, they will follow it, but mostly through the recaps, mostly through kind of like the, the lens on, on the other side. But if they found a way to work together and they created a tour, it would be incredible. I just don't know if they're going to do that. That's a big question mark. You got these two major players, and one kind of has to cede a little to the other, and I don't know if they will. Uh, we'll come up to audience questions soon, but last couple for me. So. Uh, when you're considering the future of something, like chess, I feel like a very natural thing to think about is how is the next generation engaging with it, right? And, you know, you've obviously uh, worked with a lot of young people, and I think a lot of people have heard, like, chess is becoming more popular in schools and stuff, but with your kind of insider perspective on this, what have you been seeing on how younger folk are engaging with the game, and does that give you hope for the future? Yeah, it does and it doesn't, unfortunately. So on a just very simple and straightforward level. Uh, if any of you have kids or if you have uh, relatives uh, who, who have kids or you uh, are, if there's kids in the audience, I don't know, like you should definitely in some way learn and play chess 
as young as possible. It has unbelievable cerebral benefits. Like it, 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 it teaches you so many different things. Your brain is also, it, it will learn much faster at that young age. Uh, and uh, kids come up to me now and they say hello and they want a picture with me who look like they would have bullied me in school. <laughs> and that is my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> Converting cool six foot tall teenagers who are like buff and look like they could be my parents into chess fans. Like, these kids now, you know, they're like, they're so excited. It's one of their biggest hobbies. And back in the day, they would have shoved me in a locker. And it's like, it's a very funny and jarring sight. Uh, and then you have the kids that are prodigies. You have the kids that are very, very strong and trying to uh, progress and become elite players. And I don't exactly know how it works in tennis. I sort of rattled off, I would love to see chess have a tennis system, but I don't know what it's like to be a junior player in tennis trying to break into the Grand Slams. You probably lose money every year. It's a very expensive sport. But we have in America the youngest ever grandmaster of all time, Abhimanyu Mishra from New Jersey. He became a grandmaster at 12 years old and something, all right? At 12 years old, I was 2,000. He was 2,600. He can't get a sponsor. And that's really the problem with chess is different parts of the world support their kids differently. Like in India, there is a state sponsorship that you can get with companies that literally will bankroll your tournaments. And that is why they have 20 grandmasters under the age of like 25 or something now. It is ridiculous. Like they are a chess powerhouse. They're trying to bid for, they just had Gukesh win the candidates. And Gukesh is 17 years old, the youngest ever winner. We might have the youngest world champion of all time. And it's basically just because of Vishwanathan Anand and now the efforts of the country as a whole. But every country is different. And here, we don't do as good of a job. Uh, and that can change. But the problem with chess, the problem with chess is that it, it, it's so, it is so global. And so players from all over the world at a young age don't have a chance to play against each other. And so their skill, their elo is like incubated. And so what happens when they converge in a place like Dubai, there was a tournament in Dubai recently, a bunch of players from Iran, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, India, they just like, they take everyone's rating because they don't have an opportunity to play that, that frequently. Tournament is near there. They've been training for a year. They go, they like, they, they crush it. And so now we're seeing rating deflation from the top 10, which used to get invited to their own tournaments. And we have this thing happening where it's not really clear what's going on. So uh, I am hopeful because we have so much young, talent all around the world. I'm not hopeful for it back here in the States. I don't know what's gonna happen, um, and I'm a little bit sad, but I really wish we didn't just you know, rely on, 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 the, on folks to be generous. I, I, I really wish we had like a system in place and we could develop that talent and send them off to compete for championships. Oh. Yeah, maybe if some other country kind of spearheads you know, the, the growth of the game, it'll kind of be like with the NBA, where obviously it started in the US being really popular, but now China is like huge on basketball. Mm -hmm. so. Maybe that can bring it back to the States. I would be extremely happy. So last one from me. Uh, so for folks who don't already watch chess competitions today, what would you recommend as a good entry point to get into that? Chess boxing. <laughs> uh, not all events are like that, though. I would say you can probably start with whatever channel that you want on YouTube. If you like, let's say you don't know how to play. You start with whatever channel you want, or if you want to you know, check out a book. Maybe you don't like the way this book is written and you buy a different book. Just start. Like the most important thing that I tell people is it's a lot less difficult than you think, uh, but you do have to be ready to lose a lot and you will learn. And as long as you can get past that little hurdle, uh, you will learn and it will be really, really helpful for you. Not just on a, on a level of feeling like you're improving at something that's quite challenging, you could also, like I said, Wednesday night, local spot, you know, you, you might build friendships, community. It's really two reasons any of us do anything outside of work and all of our daily necessities is like to feel like we're kind of improving at something and growing or to be part of a community. I mean, you could also say like uh, relaxation entertainment. Maybe chess kind of relaxes you, <laughs> but maybe, maybe not. But uh, to, to like improve at a hobby that, that's not kind of our day to day. Um, so if I had to name an event specifically, I would say the Speed Chess Championship is coming up in a couple of months. That's going to be very exciting. And later this year, we have the World Chess Championship. Uh, watch the World Chess Championship. It's going to be pretty nuts. So, yes, go, go, Awesome. Cash. <laughs> well, we can uh, go to some audience questions now, so maybe we can pull up the dory. All right, so this is a... Uh... Oh, wow. People don't just have to, like, be brave and get up to the... Oh, we're going we're gonna to do some live questions oh, as okay. well. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. If you were in charge of the upcoming FIDE World Championship, how would you design it, both in terms of format, time control, how it's structured, covered, presented, commentated, advertised, etc.? Yeah, like I said, I did an interview with the FIDE CEO, and I kind of asked him, like, hey, how come you guys haven't utilized influencers more? I'm going to give you a very painful example. I didn't say it to his face. I felt that was... I'm not a journalist. Journalists are very good at kind of sitting down, asking a very important and pointed question, and not being worried at, like about, I, I can't... I'm, I don't have the training for that. I don't have any experience doing that. I really wanted to. I had a lot of really hard-hitting questions. The hard-hitting question I asked them was, why don't you utilize influencers more? Uh. I mean, like, look at the views we pull just because people care about us and, like, the way we present chess. And he kind of said, well, in the past, you know, we, he gave a really good PR answer. I got it. Like, he was really good at it. Like, it was, it made me think that it was a stupid question. <laughs> uh, and he kind of said, look, we haven't, you know, mutually see, seen each other's ways of thinking and so on, and, and we'll do a better job in the future. And um, specifically for this, like, they even published a budget. Like, they started taking bids for the World Championship, right? Think about how crazy that is. We have to plan the biggest event in chess within six months. Like, places plan things two, three years in advance, but we don't know who's going to qualify. We have to wait for that tournament to finish before we do this. Um, I would not host the event in India, not because I don't absolutely adore the Indian crowd. I think that would put a lot of pressure on Gukesh. I think playing a... Uh, an event like that in the hometown. Also, it is a little strange to have the challenger have the home field advantage. Mm. It is just a little bit like, there was talks of Singapore. Great, let's do it in Singapore. Let's do multiple fan zones every single day. Uh, let's offer you know, VIP ticket pricing and non-VIP ticket pricing and you have a chance to meet influencers, players. Andrea Bocelli was in Toronto for the candidates. Like, that's incredible. I mean, are you kidding me? Have an opportunity to meet these people. Make a budget for marketing and for influencers. Fly them in. Spend some money on them, because y'all spend money on yourselves, Fide. You know it. You watch this way. You guys spend money on yourself. Fly us out, too. Get us into a hotel room. There's all this debate right now on social media about, about this and, and, and the budget and everything. And make it the biggest spectacle possible. Get everybody in Singapore talking about it. I was in Toronto last month on the streets of Toronto. First ever candidates tournament in North America. They didn't know it was happening. How did they not buy local Instagram ads? Local, you know, like Google ads. It's like, how did they not buy all they, ugh, Do that. That's what we need to, we need to know. Everybody, it has to be the biggest thing that happens in Singapore or wherever it's going to happen uh, in 2024. Uh, the structure is the structure. They're not going to change the time format. They're not going to change any of that stuff. Um, but in the future, I would love for a, you know, excuse me, like a format where it's a mix of everything. It's a mix of rapid, blitz, and slow chess. How are we going to call it the classical world championship where a game can take six hours, but if it's tied after 14 rounds, we have to play fast chess? <laughs> can somebody explain that to me? How come the tie breaks are 15 minute chess? I, understand, I mean, I understand. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is we don't do this. The alternative is we do a, 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 a calendar year of rankings, and, you know, but again, big risk. So I'll try to do uh, some of these other ones a little faster. I don't know. We just we, we scroll down, or do we? How do we well, do it? Well, uh, if folks have any live questions in the room, feel free to step up to the mic. Yeah. Oh. My name is Heather. Uh, not only do I work here, I run a local chess club out of Greenpoint here in New York. We are North Book and Chess on Instagram. There's a lot of chess clubs in New York and Brooklyn specifically now. I have my friend Micah here. He runs Bushwick Chess. Uh, we're big fans. My question to you is, especially being someone local, you know, what can the New York City chess community do to either bring us together or bring us on a larger stage? You know, we have partnerships with LeBain. We're popping up at LeBain Nightclub to do chess events. Damn. And so, you know, what do you think of that? And what can we do more of and better of for New York City chess culture? Honestly, you're already off to a really good start. I think uh, Thank if, if there was, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Like, I, I, uh, I think if there's anything, I'm, I'm in talks with a kind of better, to, to potentially create kind of like a, a better Meetup app. Like, back in the day, I would just go on Meetup, and I would find, you know, I, I used to be in a group called uh, Basketball for the Vertically Challenged. It was for people to play under 5'11", and I'm, you know, like 5'9 and a, and a quarter, so I, uh, it's in shoes. And so that was the way I, I would play. Um, the question is ultimately like, and I have to think about this as well. Okay, so let's say more and more people keep coming to these events and ultimately like they're, they're booked up and I was invited to one in Astoria as well at the Beer and Cheese on like uh, Dipmars or whatever. And, um, Astoria Chess Club. Yes, Astoria Chess Club, exactly. Wednesday nights. <laughs> yes. So but the problem is, if you're all on Wednesday nights, then it's it's, it's we tough. We on Thursday, by the way. Yes. That's, so <laughs> in Toronto, they literally do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I. 
Honestly, like I, Toronto is a great example. They have their big chess clubs, and you kind of go there once a week. There's a there's a massive, massive tournament that they do on Wednesdays that 100 people sign up for. I went when I was in the candidates. I actually won it, so that was. And then I got in trouble because I posted a picture of myself with the medal, and the flags just so happened to have the colors of like Russia. And uh, people on Twitter went, nuts. and I was like, I won a tournament. Please leave me alone. Like I didn't even. And it was like, so. I won the tournament. That was the flex that I was going for there. And they, they, it's like 100 people. 100 people show up every Wednesday night, and they uh, they play, and it's this incredible thing. Um, I didn't really ask them like what their goal is. Like, they have you know two, three hundred active members all the time. What I will tell you is, they helped organize the candidates. Like Toronto chess clubs are the reason the Toronto candidates kind of happened. So the North Star could be all the New York clubs come together, and we have some crazy high stakes chess events in New York where so many of you like basically help put it on and work with FIDE or chess.com, that might be like the North Star, because um, I know that's what they did in Toronto, and uh, I'll, I'll do a better job visiting. I like to sit at home with my wife and dog and- Bring know, them. Show, so yeah, I, so, but there's so much in-person chess at like the, just the kind of club and, and, and amateur level, and it, it's really, really cool. And, um, but, Toronto's number one, as far as I've seen. So. The first thing Brooklyn chess clubs have started to do is this Olympiad in the fall, where all of us compete in a team-based format at Brooklyn, which is, I'm sure you know the gamer bar, but it is, I don't. right, all I of don't us. leave the house well, much. Come on, you know, <laughs> uh, But anyways, all of the clubs compete together, and it's kind of our first like organized team-based activity in, in the fall, so. We're gonna send you some more information Yes, that. I'll, <laughs> I'll stop by, I'll play, I'll win it too, you know, I'll uh, just, don't, just uh, change the colors of the medal, like, or give me a different trophy or something, so. Um, thank you, Levy. Yes, thank you. Um, What's up? Okay. Hey, Levy, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Nick, I run the chess club here in New York. Uh, quick shout out, uh, there's a lot of faces here that I haven't seen at chess club. We play on this floor every Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and my question for you is, for those of us who have gotten caught up in kind of the chess boom over the past few years and learned a lot of our chess from you and are now maybe looking to take the next step, like what advice you might have uh, for maybe looking to go from like maybe, you know, intermediate to like advanced to intermediate. Level. Oh, you mean like level? I thought you meant playing tournaments or you meant yeah, just... Yeah, exactly. But... Yeah, uh, yeah, we don't make that easy in the chess world either, finding chess tournaments. Uh, Marshall Chess Club is, is generally the go-to until I build mine. But for now, go to Marshall Chess Club. Uh, they have tournaments all the time. They have tournaments uh, ev every day of the week. Uh, sometimes you play one game every Monday night at 7 p.m. You leave work, you go, you play a game, and then you, you, know, you analyze it, and et cetera. Or you play four games in one night, you get home at midnight. It's whatever your cup of tea is. Uh, I mean, in terms of chess improvement, I get asked this a lot, like, what do I recommend? It's just, it's like a never-ending process of reviewing your own games and figuring out, can I do this by myself? Uh, have I hit kind of a, a limit? Do I need a coach? Uh, what I've learned about myself over the past uh, couple of years is I, I need personal training. If I leave the gym to myself, I will quit the gym. That is just what happens. So I invested in, uh, in like a good personal trainer who, you know, and, and, and I've made some progress. Uh, and now a chess coach because I'm, I'm going back to tournaments and uh, it's a long uh, winding road of doing a lot of work not actually gaining any rating, but getting smarter at the game, and then one day you have a big breakthrough. And uh, I would say that anybody who learns chess as an adult or studies chess as an adult probably has a ceiling of uh, like like a like a like a reasonable kind of oh my god that's an impossible goal of 2200. And if you cross it, you you could yeah you could you could get the FIDE master maybe and maybe international master and but that should be your kind of cutoff. Don't try to go for grandmaster. It ain't happening. Uh, if you I think the oldest person to learn chess at 18 years old and, and become a grandmaster, like 18 is the cutoff to learn. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, you might know somebody who is going for grandmaster. Who might that be? Many people. Myself. <laughs> uh, for now, yeah, it's called. I mean, I'm, I'm, I call it going for grandmaster. It's mostly like going to a tournament and not losing to an 11 year old. First, we start with that. Uh, and actually, in 2021, I played a, an 11 year old in St. Louis who is now the youngest grandmaster in the world. Abimanyu is now 16. That was four years ago. But this kid, Andy Woodward from Texas, uh, became a grandmaster at 13. <sighs> He's like washed up, right? And, uh, <laughs> and now, uh, yeah, when I played him, I was a bit stronger than him. And um, now I still am physically. But uh, <laughs> chess, he's, uh, yeah, he, he, he's quite good. I might do a collab with him. I'm thinking, like, you know, to, to kind of fly down to Texas, interview him. Because, like, again, he's got no media coverage at all. 
So like we gotta, you know, if I have to be the sports journalist that does that in chess, that'll be, that'll be what I do. I think we got time for one more. Do we have another live question here? Hi, my name is Emmanuel. Firstly, thank you so much for teaching me the London. Really appreciate that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry I did that to you. No, no, it's 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 reliable. Sure, and then secondly, I have a friend who runs a chess startup, and that's in no way competing with Alphabet. Uh, he's this startup. <laughs> And he's, teach, he's getting all these GMs to teach kids in new, local New York City schools, which is really cool. And so when you think about the technical features, obviously, I think chess.com is the number one in terms of technical features for um, chess. Is there anything lacking there that you've seen in your experience? Because one thing that I've been thinking a lot through about is how do we get in-person games to factor into ELO? It's a lot, it's a complicated problem because obviously it, instead of the software verifying, it's like two individual people that kind of have to agree and there mm -hmm. has to be some kind of like proof of consensus. So if you've thought about any of the like technical parameters of chess and how it could be scaled upon, made better, have you thought about that at all? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it's a good point. I mean, so many games happen recreationally and offline kind of like for fun. And if we ever do build a cooler way for chess clubs to connect in cities or in uh, like, let's say, Greenpoint and Bushwick or different you know, places around the world and ultimately challenge each other, uh, that is definitely something to consider and ultimately solve. I think actually reaching out to chess.com would be really smart. They got 700 people. Someone will know what to do with the idea. But me sitting here right now, I'm like, it's a good idea. And I like the concept of, you know, I, I was doing the same thing, teaching in schools. But uh, any answer I give you will be absolute nonsense because I have not spent any time thinking about it. But uh, chess.com, they got a director of, uh, of videography here. Like, you got to hound him down and uh, get him to uh, think about this idea. Thank you so much. No problem. But one more time, Levy Rosman, everybody. Thank you, guys.